Strong, and I'm a PhD student at Annenberg School for Communication at USC. Um, my research areas are mainly about network analysis and organizational uh, communication. So I want to apply those theories and approaches to look at um, the um, in the field of ICT for D. So that's why I'm gonna bring more network stuff to you guys. Kind of carry on from yesterday's session. Um, before I get started, I want to thank my colleagues uh, for their support of this project, particularly Dr. Evan Zhu from IDRC and um, Dr. Um, CDRS from the CDMS for um, you know the constant um, support, particularly in terms of the data collection. So um, I want to start the presentation by um, bringing some of these key challenges when we're facing um, in terms of how to um, reduce poverty. Um, apparently, um, with the in the past decades, there um, with the engagement from the government, international, and local um, NGOs, there. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of um, significant success in the field of uh, poverty reduction. However, there are several challenges that still remain. For example, um, one key challenge is how we can get the, the appropriate local information about the poor, um, which might, uh, the lack of appropriate local information about the poor might uh, prevent us from the effective policy planning and also constrains our efforts to monitor change. So the another challenge is how we can capture the multi-dimensional aspects of development uh, to progress towards the MDG. So um, the importance of information and knowledge apparently is a consensus among our development scholars. Um, but then the need for indigenous knowledge um, has been sort of um, uh, a minute in the past sort of uh, decades. Um, so. Well, I basically posed a question here. What can be considered a good public policy choice for empowering the poor? Apparently, the key message is the, is the sort of mutual engagement of the local authorities and also um, the, the communities um, to be sort of um, in collaboration um, uh, for uh, sound development data and the evidence-based um, uh, policy uh, planning. So that's why um, my project sort of took one step back and look at um, how to engage organizations in evidence-based policy planning by looking at a case study of the community-based monitoring system. Um, I remember yesterday we talked about, um, remember the, the, uh, the morning keynote we, um, when Dr. Klein talked about the, the idea of um, uh, individual capability and also the uh, collective capability, right? So. Um, I wanted to look at organizations, particularly how, what kind of role organization can play in um, setting up initiatives for those um, more effective database. So this is basically the sort of gen uh, general background of my um, ideas. And um, the um, initiative of community-based monitoring system basically is organized a way of collecting ongoing and also recurring uh, information at local levels um, to be used by local government. Um, NGOs, um, national government <laughs> agencies, and civil society for different uh, development pur purposes. So um, this whole idea of CBMS um, is different from other types of poverty monitoring instruments in the sense that it's set on the uh, partnerships among different uh, stakeholders. So um, uh, first of all, I want to sort of mention why I think it's important to study the initiatives such as CBMS. So apparently implementing CBMS to collect data from different levels uh, apparently is a purpose reduction policy itself. Um, so the data has been used to guide the use of local budgets and um, target programs and beneficiaries. And also kind of the data has been used to lobby for uh, resource allocation, uh, to monitor the impact of crises and policies. Uh, among other things. So basically, in a word, the CBMS has been the key to ensuring effective public investment, uh, spending, and a greater public accountability. Um, the other um, sort of um, reason why it is important, also more interesting for, um, for our scholars, is that the diffusion of CBMS um, has provided an excellent case study to look at how uh, a certain type of policy, um, property reduction policy, can be diffused and localized in different cultures. So as you can see from the uh, slide here, um, so far there are um, 
25, uh, actually 19 countries that have implemented this um, data collection system. Um, and um, basically this whole idea of CBM started in uh, early 1990s uh, in Manila, Philippines. So far, as I mentioned, um, there are 25 institutes that are already involved in this implementation. So basically, you will see some kind of competition among, say, uh, more than one institute in one particular country, which is kind of an interesting story. Um, however, um, the previous study also showed that there are, it's not easy to implement this study, right? There are a lot of factors that might be constraining um, this type of innovation. For example, the regional autonomy. As we said, um, the, the data collection is not um, the whole idea of CDMS is not a sort of a top-down approach, right? They wanted to get more stakeholders involved, particularly from a, a bottom-up mechanism. So, in terms of regional autonomy, which basically refers to the degree of decentralization and the role of local government. However, another factor is the political will of local communities. You will see a lot of um, in a lot of cases that, you know, the government is, the, the central government is willing to give away some of the autonomy to the local government, but to what extent they are, uh, the local government is willing to, you know, be engaged um, in those kind of initiatives. And of course, the funding structure is always important in terms of how to uh, manage the, the human resources and then other types of resources, uh, given that you will provide the training for the um, local researchers and also getting um, some types of um, uh, equipment for the uh, data analysis. So um, another thing, as I mentioned earlier, um, the CBMS is actually very culture sensitive. So the local culture, of course, also plays an important role, um, particularly given that the um, uh, belief systems and then other types of um, uh, value systems will influence how citizens perceive uh, their development needs and also what capabilities should be put on priorities. So. Um, Boring you guys with all this, um, you know, uh, literature review. Finally, getting to what I'm doing right now is the um, looking at the interorganizational networks, particularly uh, the collaboration network among different um, organizations across 19 countries. Um, the whole question I asked in this project is: What factors influence the collaboration among the CDMS implementing organizations by applying two network mechanisms? First of all, a lot of people heard me saying. Uh, birds of a feather flock together. So this is one of the key network mechanism um, sort of in place. Um, it's called homophily. Thinking about how many, um, maybe we, we should sort of jump out of the um, organizational context, thinking about interpersonal communication. Think about Twitter or like Facebook, right? Facebook might be a more appropriate example to think about homophily. How many people, how many friends of yours share on Facebook share certain types of research interests? Or See, that's my that's my mindset of being a, a scholar. I keep saying research interests, but basically, you know, like uh, common interests, right? And then another network mechanism of the interorganizational alliance is what we call proximity. A lot of research has been done in the field of physical and um, electronic proximity, particularly with the digital revolution. There are a lot of um, research uh, that has been diverted to um, the uh, network of online. Um, sort of interactions, particularly on the social uh, media platforms. So, um, there are uh, two um, hypotheses I wanted to look at. Basically, the first one is kind of getting back to our homophily. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Um, getting back to the homophily effect, particularly I wanted to test if um, organizations of the same type would be more likely to collaborate with each other. And the second hypothesis will be about <coughs> Right? in terms of the, the uh, geographic distance and also how often they actually communicate with each other. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about uh, the sort of details of the, of the data collection, but basically, as I mentioned, I asked them to um, nominate sort of the, uh, their collaboration partners. And um, 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 for people who are, I'm not sure how, how many of us in this, in this room are familiar with some of the network concepts, but basically, I wanted to look at who are those influential um, actors in the implementing network by looking at uh, the betweenist centrality in the sense that um, how uh, sort of uh, how 
reachable uh, one particular node is in this particular network, and also the uh, closeness um, uh, centrality in the sense that the sort of how fast the information can travel. So I also look at how uh, the cor correlation between different networks, and then there are a lot of um, statistical analysis that I have conducted. So I'm, I'm just going to jump to the findings, which might be more interesting, particularly for scholars coming from different regions. Um, apparently, for the node network, you're, you might just think about, you know, the intuitive would be, um, of course, all these organizations are kind of implementing the same types of system. So we might think that all of them will be, you know, familiar with each other. But the case is that um, the reality is that a lot of them are actually not aware of each other's existence. Um, so um, apparently, among all these 25 organizations, the top three well-known institutes are coming from Africa, and then two from Africa, one from Asia. Um, uh, three of them are actually all academic institutes. So you can see the sort of the, the influence of academic um, in this um, implementing. Um, and um, this is the network graph, and Basically, uh, I try to graph them so you can see the patterns of the connection. Um, but it, what's more interesting is uh, uh, apparently the collaboration network. I'm looking at the this number. I was like, oh my gosh, they're so the centralization is so high. Basically, it means that there are several organizations in this network. They are very influential. A lot of you wanted to um, collaborate with them. So apparently, some of the um, key takeaways is that organizations from Africa were more active in constructing their collaboration network, even though the whole initiative of CBMS um, was based in um, Asia. Um, and um, um, also, African, particularly African academic institutes, were the most connected groups to others. So it seems like there's a whole implementing network. So um, apparently, the Note 19 uh, is the CBMS coordinating team based in Manila. So I decided to move them, to remove them from the network graph and to see sort of um, how the network would look like. Apparently, they become um, three different sort of subgroups. And um, one of the interesting things is um, even within the African groups, there can be divided into two subgroups. And apparently, the there is um, there was close relationship between African and Asian institutes, particularly <coughs> and academic institutes. However, Asian institutes seem to hate each other. They didn't really have very close connection with each other, which was kind of surprising for me. But I carry all these findings to the, um, well, apparently I have more statistics, but I'm going to just uh, skip it by simply saying the homophilic uh, hypothesis was support. So remember what I just said, uh, birds of a feather flock together, right? So that was supported. But then apparently the uh, geolocation, net um, geolocation network was not highly correlated with the collaboration network, um, provided some preliminary evidence for um, the argument that, you know, the geolocation may not um, influence or become the barrier for the implementation, as we can see from the collaboration between Africa and Asia academic institutes. So apparently there are a lot of um, things that need to be done in the future, but I, I just want to sort of conclude um, by saying, um, we also wanted to look at the hyperlink uh, for people who are familiar with the hyperlink network analysis. Basically, the hyperlink has been conceptualized as a, uh, the resources for different organizations to refer to each other, right? So um, um, that's kind of an indicator for partnerships. And uh, usually hyperlinks is more um, sort of um, available instead of you know talking to, try to get everybody from the organization to respond to your survey. That was really hard, trust me. <laughs> Um, and um, um, for people who might be familiar with the IDRC's work, we recently uh, presented some results from the survey by looking at the partners collaboration uh, network. For example, we wanted to map out their conference attendance uh, network in the past few years and also their publication network. Uh, try to see if there is kind of a, a certain pattern in involving, particularly, you know, uh, people from different disciplines might be uh, more likely to work with each other. Um, try kind of like a, have a complementary uh, skill set. And um, some other interesting things um, we will do in the future is that, you know, um, remember the, the whole network structure among the Asian institutes? Um, and then think about the outcome of the implementation. Apparently, four institutes from Asia already stopped or suspended. They wanted to use the sort of a nicer word, suspended, instead of saying it stopped, okay? 
um, they're saying th th this is already um, the whole CBMS was um, suspended in four organizations from Asia. And then um, we basically wanted to measure some of the outcome variables saying why this is the case, how we can actually prevent some of those things from happening. So um, I think this, this is what I have. Um, happy to take any questions in the first time. Thank you.